Hey, hello, and welcome back to Science as Process and Perspective. In the last lecture, we've looked at the idea of absolute truth, what it means to prove something and that that is only possible, maybe, we're not even sure, in the formal sciences and logic and mathematics. The only thing we can really be sure about and know for sure is that we exist, that there is something that is thinking when we're thinking although it's not quite clear what that something is even there. So this sort of puts a very new light on how we should see science. I told you that if you want absolute knowledge, you should go to church, that it has never been the purpose of science to produce absolute knowledge, certain knowledge. Scientific knowledge is always uh, open to revision, always tentative, um, always open to sort of the black swan that comes along and proves that your hypothesis is wrong, so you can falsify it. And so if you consider this, then you should be very skeptical about any sort of empirical scientist saying something has been proven to be this way or another. For example, uh, genetically manipulated um, food is proven to be safe. No, it has not maybe harmed anyone yet. Well, that's controversial but it certainly isn't proven to be safe. Okay, there could always be a sort of a, uh, a case that appears, the black swan, that proves it to be unsafe, where harm is being done, and so on and so forth. I don't wanna pick out GMO as a specific example. Any sort of um, empirical science that's based on inductive reasoning will be um, open to this vulnerability. So scientific knowledge, never proof, never absolute, never certain. So where does that leave us? That leaves us with a very big sort of danger of saying, okay, so scientific knowledge it's, is not special at all. There is no way of getting in touch with reality. And we see this very often among, for example, postmodernist scholars saying that there is no privileged way of knowing. All kinds of knowing are the same. And this is a very sort of wrong thing to say. And it's a very sort of, you know, generalized way of looking at the problem. So what we're going to do in the next two lectures is we're going to have a look at how this notion of realism, this approach, this stance towards science can maybe be rescued with a more realistic way of how we're actually doing science as finite human beings. So let us start as usual with a bunch of questions. So here, we're sort of asking, is scientific knowledge socially or culturally constructed? As usual, take a bit of time, maybe pause the video and write down the answer. Is scientific knowledge a social or cultural construct? Does it depend on the history of science? Or on the kind of scientific community it is generated by, even now, today, do different countries with different kinds of society generate different knowledge? Does the subjective experience of a researcher influence the scientific knowledge they produce? So now we're sort of homing in on the individual background of researchers. If so, how does it do that? And how much does it influence the scientific power? Is the scientific method a filter that filters out um, these sort of personal biases. Is scientific knowledge, if scientific knowledge is a social construct, cultural construct, can it still refer to an objective reality? That's a very big question. And if so, how can it do that? These are actually the questions that will keep us busy for two lectures now, because it's both a very central sort of topic of this course, and it is a very complicated question. How can we acknowledge that scientific knowledge does depend on history, it is socially constructed, and yet is still in a way different from other way, ways of knowing? And so to do that, let us quickly recap what we've been looking at uh, last time, which is the, the sort of doctrine of objectivist realism. The truth is out there, the scientific method is a formal way of confronting it. And there is exactly one true and complete description of the way the world is and the words of Hilary Putnam here. 
in his book, Reason, Truth, and History, where he actually criticizes this sort of view. So I call this uh, stance naive realism, the sort of objectivist realism that a lot of researchers still hold today, but that isn't really sort of consistently formulated. It's just a bunch of vague ideas that people have uh, and that they haven't really examined. And we've been examining those ideas very critically the last time. And what we've concluded in general, from all these sort of problems that we looked at with certainty and absolute knowledge, is that scientific knowledge is what we could call underdetermined. And that means that the observational evidence that we have always underdetermines the claims of a scientific theory about unobservables. So let's step back very quickly and revise a little bit what I mean by an unobservable. In past lectures, we've come across this fact that there are observable things in the universe. There were some problems with it, remember? So the, the positivist said that you can just point at an object and say, this is it. While Bertrand Russell was telling them, no, the only words that are defined like this really in the English language are this and that. You can point at something say, this, I mean this. But as soon as you have a concept of something, like a wall here behind me, you have to have attributes already, you know, in your, your mind about what a wall is. So to distinguish something, an object, we need to make a, a difference, uh, you know, distinguish a difference that makes a difference in the words of Gregory Bateson. So we pick out objects that are important to us. These objects arise through an interaction that we have re with reality. But these objects that we can then ultimately point to is, as soon as we know what they are, this wall, they're observables. We can see what they are, how they behave, and how they interrelate with other observables. However, scientific theories always uh, also invoke unobservables. Think about physical theories, force, mass. Those are, are quantities that are not directly observable. We need to infer them through deductive or inductive reasoning. And we also said that you can be a realist or not about such unobservables. Think about an electron. Is an electron real? Is it a thing that is out there? Or is it just a concept we use as an instrumentalist would say? It's a concept that we use in a theory that makes the theory work, but there is no such thing out there as an electron. It's just an idea. So we need to think really seriously about this because one sort of uh, argument is, is, is pretty uh, well established and that is that um, whatever evidence we have from observables underdetermines claims about those things we cannot observe. That is very important. And so this means that there will always be an indefinite number of scientific theories that explain the same observable phenomena not an infinite number, an indefinite number. We can go back again to the discussion of Copernicus, heliocentric worldview versus the geocentric worldview. Both theories, a geocentric worldview with all the deference and epicycles and the heliocentric worldview of Copernicus explain exactly the same observations, but they are based on really different um, sort of unobservable assumptions. Well, later on, when we could travel to space, they became observable. But at the time, the differences between those theories were not observable directly. So how do you decide between different theories in this way? That's a problem, and it's often very difficult. OK, so underdetermination is sort of an umbrella term for all kinds of problems that we've already encountered. It comes out of the problem of verification, the sort of inability for us to prove something positively, the logical fallacy that, that um, uh, Popper was talking about, that is basically rooted in the problem of induction because we can never be sure from just observing a finite sample of um, instance of something that it's generally true. And of course, the problem of theory laid in this, this sort of um, uh, Kuhn's idea of salience that you know, depending on what kind of worldview you have, you come into a problem um, with very different um, sort of aims and you want to identify very or measure very different um, 
uh, quantities. Remember the Aristotelian versus the Newtonian studying the pendulum, okay? So all of these problems, we're all in Neurath's boat, basically. That's something that Quine said. So we cannot step out of this process. We're sailing in this boat and we have to sort of revise it as we go along. Okay, we cannot just jump in the sea and swim in this metaphor. So basically what this means is that reality seems capable of sustaining more than one account of it. And there is always room for interpretation. And that, that is sort of a really big problem, okay? If we are to sort of explain why scientific knowledge is different from other kinds of knowledge. And the problem that is at the core of this issue here is, is that knowledge is not discovered, but constructed by scientists in a specific setting, at a specific time in history, in a specific society, with specific politics and a specific scientific community with specific individuals that have specific individual subjective backgrounds, biases, and experiences. Okay, so what is considered scientific or even natural changes over time? We've briefly discussed this when talking about naturalism. Astrology used to be a perfectly acceptable science. Magnetism was magic until it got incorporated into physics and is now completely standard part of physics no miracle at all. And so there is a historical path dependence of scientific knowledge that we simply can't deny if we look at the historical, um, the history of science in general, you know, the application of the scientific method, the questions we ask, and the way we interpret the answers depends on our social and historical circumstances. And that's very important. So these sort of social aspects, subjective aspects of doing science, they mainly address um, they mainly concern the questions we ask, for example, and, and sort of the explanations we accept as valid. And remember, if we, if we talk about Popper, this is exactly the part of science that he completely ignores. He says, where the hypotheses that you have come from is completely unimportant. What the science method, scientific method does, it, it, is, it allows you to falsify wrong hypotheses that you've generated. But what kind of hypotheses you generate is completely unimportant in his view which is a huge oversimplification, okay? Because it is very important what kind of questions you ask. Some questions may never be asked. Some alternatives may never be considered. And some explanations that are perfectly scientifically valid may never be accepted because of some sort of bias that people have at a certain time. We'll come back to this problem uh, in future lectures. So that leads to something which is called the contingency hypothesis. And to formulate it a little bit formally, it says in one set of so social circumstances, correct scientific method applied to a problem would precipitate a result, let's call it P. Whereas in another set of social circumstances, correct scientific method, whatever that is under those circumstances applied to the same problem would precipitate result Q, where perhaps Q implies not P. Okay, so they could be completely in contrast contradictory to each other. So we cannot deny what I'm saying here is that we cannot deny the possibility that this is happening. It could still be that the scientific method we've come up with is a perfect sort of filter for these sort of influences on the long run. But that opens the question, what is the long run? How long do we actually have to study something? How long does the scientific method take to filter out those biases? Has it happened already or do we still have, what are those biases right now? What have they been historically? Of course, it's much easier to look back in time and see what kind of assumptions, what kind of theories stood the test of time and which ones didn't. But we have no idea what it is right now um, that we should uh, be, be careful with and, and what sort of parts of our knowledge we should trust and which parts we, we shouldn't, which are just completely biased sort of historical accidents in our knowledge. Okay, so this, this problem is huge. And of course, it's, it's sort of an empirical question to, to go and investigate what the influence of history and social influences, um, what those influences actually are, okay? So we can actually study this empirically. And that's sort of the approach we're gonna take here.
The interesting thing about constructivism, of course, is that it's reflexive. Social constructivism itself is a social construct. This is, is a funny thing because it's often forgotten. Think about modern sort of, uh, so the, the original postmodernists, that is post-structuralist philosophers in France in the 1960s, like Michel Foucault, and people like that, um, Jacques Derrida, they were very aware of this problem, okay? But today we have a lot of sort of relativists that are saying, oh, science is just sort of a, a social construct of a specific sort of Western society and there's nothing special about it. But what they forget is that the assumptions they take, that everything is sort of wrapped in, in social discourse, they don't question that themselves. So they have forgotten about the reflexivity of social constructivism, which is sort of mind bending. Okay, itself, it's just a social construction and it could be wrong. So we have to live with that somehow. So there is no way we can get out of the fact that in some, at least minimal way, social uh, scientific knowledge is socially constructed, is the product of a specific time and place. But that sort of, it, it creates a sort of a, a a paradox, right? So we have objective realism, which says knowledge is discovered, the truth is out there. There is ex exactly one true and complete description of the way the world is, and social constructivism that says knowledge is constructed and reality is capable of sustaining more than one account of it. Those two things are mutually incompatible. I told you that. And so that led to all kinds of discussions and something that was called the science wars in the 1990s. You may not have noticed those wars because A, you may not have been around. I was around back then, but I didn't notice them. They were very quiet wars that were fought in very specialized academic um, departments, sociologists of science on one way, that, uh, on one hand that said, you know, there is this sort of social influence and some really radical ones that said, that there's nothing but social construction. You can't get anywhere near reality. And on the other hand, scientists and, and science departments these wars become very nasty. Nasty. There was something called the Sokol Affair, where Alan Sokol uh, published a uh, hoax paper in a social, uh, in, in a cultural studies um, uh, journal, um, and sort of said, you know, these social scientists are all frauds, and it was very bitter. Okay, and it went back and forth, and and it's still raging. Actually, the debate is still going on, especially in education. There is a big debate between sort of realists and constructivists that are, are sort of seen. So there's this um, opposition between realism and constructivism, but there's a problem with that. And also there is a middle way that we can go in between. And what we, we need to do uh, to realize this middle way is we need um, to sort of see that you can have realism with perspective. Okay, so the, the, the sort of the Opposition is not between realism, believing that there's a real world out there and then that, that our knowledge can somehow get access to it and constructivism, the idea that um, our knowledge is socially constructed. But the problem is between objectivist realism versus constructivism only. So you can be a realist and a constructivist. You cannot be an objectivist realist and a constructivist at the same time. And since constructivism is not deniable with any sort of by any reasonable means, that is just another reason why I think this objectivist realism is, is a completely incoherent sort of stance towards scientific knowledge. And we need to get rid of it. What does that all mean? Okay. Is that not just, you know, well, what is a perspective? Is it just your opinion, man? Everybody is entitled to their opinion, is what um, Vice President Mike Pence recently said, with the idea that you can look at reality whatever way you want. And, you know, your way of knowing is just as, as good as, as my way of knowing. So this is what we call the post-factual sort of world we're in, and it's very dangerous. So science is under attack from the religious right to the postmodern left people are saying, okay, it's just another point of view. It's just, you know, one among many valid ways of knowing. And that is not true if we look at it a bit more carefully. 
So we need to know a little bit more about in what way is a perspective, not just your opinion, you know? And I'm gonna use this wonderful little book, Ron Geary's Scientific Perspectivism to um, argue in some detail that, you know, you, you can have a perspectivist sort of realism. You can be both a perspectivist who believes that your individual experience, your background is important for scientific knowledge, but also a realist saying that scientific knowledge is in some way getting at something that's real. So here is Ron Geary, um, who actually died this year, I should change this slide. He's saying, um, in common parlance, a perspective is often just a point of view. In a sense that on any topic, different people can be expected to have different points of view, okay? This understanding is usually harmless enough in everyday life, unless it's you know, uttered by a Republican politician. But it can be pushed to the absurd extreme that every perspective is regarded as good as any other. That's the problem. Okay, and that's the problem that especially uh, postmodernists um, have, okay? So that's not what we mean here by perspectival realism, by perspective. That's just silly relativism. And that's actually a straight quote from Ron Geary's book. I love it. We don't want to fall into silly relativism. There are clear differences of different ways of knowing. If you just read some conspiracy theory on the internet, your way of knowing is probably not going to be as good as someone who's done some real research, empirically grounded research on a topic. So maybe a sort of this picture helps understand what a perspective really is. So here we have a statue of David Hume um, by Alexander Stoddard. It stands on the Royal Mile in Edinburgh. And I'm sure Hume wouldn't um, mind being used in this way. Uh, it's a very sort of be beautiful way. You can, you can look at this statue from different angles, right? So I, I just, I'm showing you one picture here from a pers particular perspective. So there is a real statue there. It's made out of, um, rock, con concrete, I don't know what it exactly is made of. And you can look at it. You can look at it from different angles. You can look at it in the morning. You can look at it in the evening. You can look at it when it rains, probably mostly rains, but sometimes it's sunny in Scotland and you can see it in the sun. And those impressions will not necessarily add up to a sort of a three, four dimensional picture of the statue over time in space and all that in your mind. But still, it will give you a picture that's richer than looking at um, the statue just from just one angle, okay? And so this sort of, the knowledge you get about the statue rises. There is a real statue out there. It's independent of you. It's still there when you sleep, when you're not there, when you're not looking at it. But um, the sort of picture you can get of the statue radically depends on your personal interaction with that statue. That's what a perspective is, okay? So in Ron Geary's word, perspectivism makes room for constructivist influences in any scientific investigation. We always have to assume that there is some sort of constructivist influence. The extent of such influences can be judged only on a case by case basis. And then far more easily in retrospect and during the ongoing process of research, it's really hard to recognize when the problem is really strongly influenced by our biases and when it's not. But full objectivist realism, absolute objectivism remains out of reach, even as an ideal. That last part is actually really important. Okay, so absolute knowledge is not for finite beings. It's absolutely uh, impossible, unreachable, as far as we know. And again, we could also be wrong about this. The Innes, oh, so, so this is what, what uh, Geary calls naive or what I call naive realism, okay? It's, it's not attainable, even in principle. The inescapable, even if banal fact, is that scientific instruments and theories are human creations. You cannot escape this conclusion. I don't think you can. We simply cannot transcend our human perspective. That makes sense. You cannot step out of your, your own head, however much some may aspire to a God's eye view of the universe. So basically, you cannot have a view from nowhere. 
the view is always from your perspective and there is no way you can escape that perspective. Of course, no one denies that doing science is a human activity. That would be silly, right? What needs to be shown in detail, however, is how the actual practice of science limits the claims scientists can legitimately make about the universe. And that, again, is a sort of a thing that needs to be done case by case. There's no general theory of this. It needs to be done case by case, and it can be done empirically, but probably only it's easier to do it in any case, in retrospect, than while you're doing an investigation. So what this means is we have to focus much more, if we want to understand science, on the process of doing science, not its products. This is something that we'll come back to at the end of the next lecture. OK? So if we want to understand knowledge generation, we need to get out of this sort of cage we've built ourselves by looking at general theories of abstract propositional knowledge, justified true belief. It's not useful. Instead, we need, if we want to know which kind of scientific knowledge is trustworthy and which one is not, we must look at the practice of doing science, not just the products of doing science. So these are just great quotes. Sorry, they're a bit long, but um, I'm going to go through them because they really state the point very, very clearly. And I do recommend this book, Scientific Perspectivism. It's short, it's very clear, it's very accessible. And you will never see science the same way after you've read it. So here Geary says, by claiming too much authority for science, and that's important, objective realists misrepresent science as a rival source of absolute truths. Remember, scientism. Richard Dawkins, Neil deGrasse Tyson, and Stephen Hawking, thus inviting the charge that science is just another religion, another faith. Yes, that's not what it is. A proper understanding of the nature of scientific investigation supports the rejection of all claims to absolute truths. That's what science is about, not knowing for sure. The proper stance, I maintain, is a methodological naturalism. We've come across this already that supports scientific investigation, as indeed the best means humans have devised for understanding both the natural world and themselves as part of that world. Okay, no magic allowed. So we have to try to find naturalist explanations for as many phenomena, for as many sort of aspects of our own lives that we can. That is what we subscribe to when we do scientific research. It is something that we do not have to believe that the whole universe is, is explainable by naturalist explanations, but we commit as scientists, as researchers, to methodological naturalism when we do science. Otherwise, we're not scientists. That, I think, is a more secure ground on which to combat all pretenses to absolute knowledge, including those based on religion, political theory, or in some cases, science itself. When somebody says science produces provable facts and it's better than you know, is, 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 is a secure, a source of certain knowledge like the positivists do, that is just plain wrong, okay? And it is uh, misguided, it is misleading, and we should stop doing that. We need to explain also to the public what science really is about. It's the best way that humans have devised for understanding both the natural world and themselves as part of that world. But since we're finite being, imperfect beings, it is not a perfect way to understand the world, but there is no better way. So science and scientific knowledge is special if we want to understand the sort of world we live in. It is not just another way of knowing, absolutely not, if I may use that term. Okay, so just briefly going back to this methodological naturalism. So this rejects appeals to any supernatural or a priori claims of any kind. So I mentioned the magic, you can use magic, but also there is no a priori claim. You know, There is no axiom that goes undisputed. There is no absolute truth, even in analytic statements because it depends on those axioms and definitions that you deduce um, your, your, your conclusions from. And so you end up with uh, a sort of a pragmatism and a very instrumental justification of doing science, which is a method is good to the extent that it tends to select hypotheses with desirable characteristics, such as agreement with data or wide applicability over hypotheses that lack these characteristics. 
And we'll talk a lot more, we'll come back to this when we, we talk about the process of doing science and the sort of um, epistemic goals that people have when they do science. We'll come back to this topic. Okay, so two things we're taking out of this. If we take this sort of perspectival stance, we need to pay a lot more attention to the actual practice, the process of doing science, not just some abstract view of knowledge um, as a set of true propositions. And um, we need uh, to be very pragmatic and see what is the context in which uh, a method, an insight is good in some way, is useful in some way, makes sense in some way. Okay, so basically, now we, we have a pretty radically um, uh, revised view. So the truth is out there, but what part of it we will be able to perceive not only depends on our limitations, but also on our motives and questions which determine the problems we choose to care about. And that is a strongly historically and socially dependent sort of process, okay? There are a lot of blind spots we have at any point of in time because we're limited. We're limited in time, we're limited in capacities. Alternative perspectives are not only desirable in this view, they are absolutely essential for a science that truly represents the diversity of human interests and viewpoints while trying to grapple with the mind boggling complexity of reality. This is very important because if you're an objectivist realist, you don't need diversity in science at all. It doesn't matter, remember Merton's universalism. It doesn't matter who you are, if you apply the scientific method, you will get at the truth. This is not right, okay? Because who you are will determine what questions you ask and what explanations you accept. And so it's very important. So there's a huge blind spot in positivism and objectivist realism in general towards this sort of subjective aspect of doing science. And we need to pay a lot more attention to this if we want to take science and its role in society seriously. But still, in this lecture, I told you it's a complicated, a complex topic. I haven't really gotten to the central point yet, which is what is real then? Okay, so now you can be a radical pragmatist or a sort of a, a constructive um, empiricist and saying, okay, whatever scientific knowledge is, it's just something that's practical, it works, and that's all I need. I don't need reality, I don't need my theories to. to uh, correspond in any way to reality. How do you define real anyway? We cannot get to it, okay? So this is a quote from Morpheus in The Matrix. And it's also something that actually the postmodernists, the original post-structuralists asked in a very interesting way. Here is Sean Baudrillard's book, Simulacra and Simulation, another foundation of the Matrix movie that you should definitely read. And basically Baudrillard is saying, we live in a simulated reality by now but in a different one that Elon Musk um, uh, lives in. It's not a matrix for the whole universe, but it's, it's not a brain in a vat, but it's a socially constructed reality. And how can we recognize what is biased in this reality and what is um, pointing at something beyond? Is this even possible? This is what the next lecture will be about. And I'll leave you for now with this wonderful quote by one of my favorite science fiction writers, Philip K. Dick. And he says, reality is simply that which when you stop believing in it, doesn't go away. I will go away though for now. And I'll see you next time when we talk about perspectival truth and multi-perspectival realism. And I hope to see you back then. Bye now. <laughs>